On behalf of Harvard Bookstore and our co-sponsor, the South Asia Institute at Harvard University, I'm pleased to welcome you to tonight's program with Ramachandra Guha and Pratap Banu Mehta. They'll be discussing, this, discussing <laughs> Mr. Guha's new book, Gandhi Before India. Ramachandra Guha uh, is a noted writer and scholar, and his work ranges from environmental and social history to politics. He has written and edited more than 20 books, including India After Gandhi and A Corner of a Foreign Field, an Indian history of a British sport, both of which received critical acclaim. He is a columnist for The Telegraph and The Hindustan Times. And although he is based in Bangalore, he teaches around the world and recently held the Philippe Roman Chair in History and International Affairs at the London School of Economics. Mr. Mehta is the president of the Center for Policy Research in New Delhi. In 2011, he was honored with the Infosys Prize for Political Science, and his writing focuses on political theory, society, and politics in India. It's no exaggeration to say that Gandhi changed the course of world history. His efforts in India were a critical part of that country's independence and inspired social change movements across the 20th and 21st centuries. But how did a young man from colonial India who planned on a career in the law become the champion of nonviolent protest? In Gandhi Before India, Guha explores the experiences that awakened Gandhi's conscience and philosophy and led him to seek social reform in his own country. Please join me in welcoming Ramachandra Guha and Pratap Banu Mehta to Harvard Bookstore. Uh, good evening. Um, it's a really special occasion, and I'm actually the kind of superfluous person on this table. Uh, the only reason I agreed to do it is because um, it's a great privilege to celebrate three things I love. Um, first of all, I should say Harvard Bookstore, uh, where most of my intellectual capital from all the years I was at Harvard, I think, came from this place. Uh, it's a truly unique institution, and I hope we'll all continue to support it. Uh, the second is, of course, any chance to uh, learn more about Gandhi. And the third is to follow modernity's conventions and be shameless about celebrating one's friends like Ramchandra Guha. Um, uh, this really is an extraordinary book. Uh, I, I don't think I have to tell anybody in this uh, audience uh, what a momentous event it is in the history of Gandhi scholarship. Um, I think given the size of this, this crowd, I think, uh, you know, I'd, I'll, I'll just sort of cut my remarks very short so that we can get into the discussion um, uh, right away. I just wanted to say a couple of things um, uh, before I uh, ask Ram to, Ram to speak. Uh, first of all, it is absolutely extraordinary that uh, we are now entering a new age of golden, uh, a new golden age of scholarship on Gandhi. Um, Gandhi is an exhausting subject, but he's also an inexhaustible subject. Uh, and the quality of scholarship that you are now beginning to see on all aspects of Gandhi, um, Gandhi's political thought, Gandhi's philosophy, um, uh, Gandhi's grammar of life, and as we'll see in this in this absolutely monumental biography, uh, I think Gandhi's career as a whole is 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 is, is truly extraordinary. I think I think uh, we are privileged um, uh, uh, to be living in an era where uh, we can think Gandhi anew. I think the second thing, and, and this is just a, to set the stage for, for Ram's remarks in this biography, I think as anybody who has wrestled with Gandhi uh, intellectually, uh, biographically, and otherwise, uh, quickly comes to realize Gandhi is a subject like no other. Uh, he is sui generis, he's unhoused in any ideological categories that we understand. And in most, in the case of most other subjects, the biographer's challenge is usually to try and understand the context that made the subject who the subject is, or, or what made the subject possible, what, you know, influenced the subject. Gandhi is one of the few subjects in history who completely creates his own context, almost sui generis. Uh, and you actually find most descriptive language uh, breaking the boundaries of meaning when it comes to uh, Gandhi. Uh, just to take one example, it comes up in Ram's book, uh, uh, an, an absolutely fascinating subject, Gandhi's friendships. Uh, uh, these, are, these are truly profound extraordinary, wide-ranging in their cultural reach and sympathies. Uh, and yet it's still very difficult for a biographer to actually characterize what 
the nature of these friendships is. It's certainly not Eros, as Joseph Lelyweld would uh, uh, have, us, have us believe, and Ram has a wonderful critique of uh, his position. But it's not philia in the conventional sense either. Uh, um, you can think of almost anything Gandhi touched, um, you know, dress, um, as Sham Balganesh has recently pointed out, um, even Gandhi's stray thoughts on copyright and the act of publishing. He literally is creating a new grammar, a new. And uh, it, 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 it really takes a truly great biographer uh, to be able to get inside what Gandhi is doing and recreate that world for us. Um, the other feature about Gandhi's life, I mean, there's the 90 volumes of collected works, uh, which is an extraordinary treasure trove. But the one thing that strikes you reading them over and over again is how deliberate almost everything Gandhi writes and says it is. Uh, it's very unusual for subjects, right? who take, in a sense, the intrinsic value of every moment and every relationship to the depth that Gandhi does. There's almost nothing casual about him, right? Um, and that raises really you know, extraordinary interpretive challenges. And if there is one biographer who is equal to that task, Ram Guha, uh, uh, is that he's you know, um, uh, one of the world's leading historians and public, uh, public intellectuals. Um, he's already done extraordinary biographies before. Uh, his biography of Varia Elvin is, is, is still a classic in the biographical genre. Um, and his Gandhi, not surprisingly, will be the, 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 the Gandhi biography for the ages. So Ram, welcome. Thank you, Pratap. Thank you, everyone. One can always rely on one's friends to say generous things <laughs> about one's work. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here, partly because of the first reason, the Harvard Bookstore. In the great <coughs> New Haven, the great New Haven Cambridge rivalry, <laughs> I originally took New Haven side because my wife studied there, and I taught there. Uh, I've slowly shifted partly towards this side. I'm kind of on the fence, uh, because my uncle, uh, Venki Narayan Murthy, who's here, <coughs> who was a distinguished dean of the School and of uh, <coughs> Engineering and Applied Sciences, lived here. And he's my mama, my mother's brother. And those of you who are Indian know that that's a very special relationship. And even more special, my son studied here. And in the years my son studied here, I was often at Harvard Square and at the Harvard Bookstore. And whatever you may say about the University of Yale, and whatever you may say about the town of New Haven, it doesn't have a bloody good bookstore. <laughs> you know, it's been impoverished in that respect, at least from when I first knew it in 1985, and maybe indeed from 1885. Uh, so I'm really very pleased to be here at uh, something at a place uh, which more or less may be my second American home. New Haven is still slightly ahead for obvious reasons. And I'm going there from here. Uh, so uh, it's appropriate I'm here before this. Now, let me say a little bit about the origins of this book. Gandhi has stalked me all my life. I started as a historian of the environment. And of course, uh, experienced at first hand Gandhi's influence on contemporary Indian and global environmentalism. I wrote a book on Elwin, a maverick anthropologist who was, among other things, a kind of rebellious adopted son of Gandhi. Uh, you know, continuously arguing in his mind and publicly with Gandhi. He admired Gandhi's views on interfaith dialogue. Uh, he became an Indian citizen because of Gandhi. And yet, he couldn't abide Gandhi's credo uh, so far as diet and prohibition was concerned. Not because of himself, but because he li lived among tribal people uh, for whom alcohol consumption was part of their dance, their music, their culture, and so on. Then I wrote a social history of cricket. And although Gandhi never watched a cricket, life, a cricket match in his life, uh, Gandhi has about 72 entries in the index to that book uh, because he greatly shaped the political, cultural, racial history, religious history of cricket in India. So I, Gandhi has been stalking me for the last 35 years. Now, the origins of the book are more proximate. In 1997, 
I was invited to teach a course at the University of California at Berkeley. Now one of the nice things about teaching a course in America is you can actually choose the course you want to teach. You know, if you're in India, they ask you to teach a course, you can suggest the course. In India, on the other hand, if you want to propose a new course, it will go to the head of your department, who will forward it to the head of the school, who would forward it to the executive council, who will then deliberate on it. In, you know, it will be deferred after four meetings, it will come up, then it will go to the executive committee, and by the time it gets to the vice chancellor and gets approved, uh, your reading list is 12 or 14 years out of date. <laughs> so I was delighted by this invitation from Berkeley because I thought I'd try, try out what at that stage were my very early ideas about Gandhi. So when the invitation came, this is 1997, it's pre-email uh, and all of that, I wrote back saying, I want to teach a course called Arguments with Gandhi, which would go into Gandhi's arguments with Tagore, on nationalism, with Ambedkar, on caste, with Jinnah, on, uh, on the state, uh, with Nehru, on technology, and so on and so forth, with Martin Buber, on nonviolence. And he also came back, no, why don't you teach on the environment? In 1997, my contribution to Gandhian studies was exactly nil. On the other hand, I've written several books on environmental themes, are likely to be popular in California, a, trait, uh, a state populated by tree huggers and energy entrepreneurs both. So I insisted. I wrote back saying, no, I want to teach on Gandhi. And the answer came back from uh, my, the person who invited me saying, look, are you sure you want to go ahead? We can't stop you because, you know, we give you the freedom to design the course you want to teach. But we would like to warn you that it's entirely possible that there'll just be four or five people signed up for your course, and they will all be ABCDs, <laughs> namely, America-born confused Desis. Desis being Indian. <laughs> and then there was a footnote added saying, in fact, they are more like, even more likely to be ABCDEFGs. America-born confused Desis emigrated from Gandhi's home state of Gujarat. <laughs> uh, but uh, as my friends in this room know, uh, I'm an obstinate man. So I said, no, I will teach a course on Gandhi. But, so I took the long flight from uh, Bangalore to San Francisco, uh, excited by the new materials I was going to study, because I'd never really systematically taught or researched Gandhi before, and I knew the quality of the students at Berkeley, as indeed at any great American university. But I was also a little nervous. What if only three or four people tell? That's the other problem with teaching. The, you know, the flip side of teaching in America versus India. If you teach at the University of Delhi, you can be bloody sure all the 120 students registered for the MA program will turn up. Because they have to. Because they can't do the exam otherwise. But here you don't know. You know your class could be 3, it could be 60, it could be 200. And I was nervous. What if I, on Wednesday morning, I landed in San Francisco, I think on the Saturday. Tuesday or Wednesday was my class. I didn't sleep that night, and not only because of jet lag. On Sunday, I took a walk down Telegraph Avenue, and somebody handed me a newspaper for free. This is a completely true story, by the way. Uh, it was called the Bay Area Times, I think. It was a free newspaper. I took it back to my apartment and started scanning it, and an advertisement leapt out. This advertisement said, only it was an advertisement for a photo studio. This is the pre-digital age, and the ad advertisement said, the copy ran, only Gandhi knows more than us about fast. We give you prints in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what the hell? I said, somebody in the Bay Area knows enough about Gandhi to pun on the word fast? I was completely reassured. And I went to my class. I went to my class on the Tuesday or the Wednesday, and there was a, a, a room of about 40 or 50 people with about four or four or five ABCDs. And one of whom was actually from Gujarat. But uh, there was uh, a young girl. Uh, this is 1997, who had run away from Burma. She was, had been associated in the democracy movement. There were some African-Americans trying to juggle between uh, Mal Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. There were Jewish students who had, knew vaguely about the Martin Buber Gandhi debate. Uh, they were, of course, Caucasians. It was just fantastic. It was the most interesting class I ever taught. And ever since then, 
I thought I would like to write a book on Gandhi. It's taken a very long time uh, because Gandhi is a complex and difficult subject. Now, something about the sources for this book. As Professor Mehta mentioned, there are more than 90 volumes of Gandhi's collected works. To be precise, uh, the collected works were compiled between 1958 and 1994. They ran chronologically from Gandhi's first writings, which were in the Vegetarian Society of London, interestingly, uh, uh, through his uh, years in South Africa and then, of course, his years uh, in the Indian National Movement until his death on 30th January. And these 90 volumes collected his letters, his speeches, his editorials. He was a fantastic journalist. He edited a newspaper for more than 40 years uh, altogether. Uh, his, uh, you know, his, his interviews, his, uh, his, his private correspondence, he was an indefatigable letter writer. And in three languages, English, Hindi, and Gujarati. Uh, uh, the, uh, and so the edition was published in these three languages. 90 volumes. Uh, the 90th volume was published in 1994. After that, the first one in 1958, after that, seven supplementary volumes came out uh, to take account of stuff collected since. That made 97. Then was added an index of persons and an index of subjects, both indispensable uh, to the scholar, 99. And that's where it should have ended. Except that Indians have an incurable love of symmetry. We invented the number zero after all. And Sachin Tendulkar never got out at 99, at least in a test match. Uh, so, an utterly superfluous volume of which collected the prefaces to the individual 97 volumes was added. And it was called Book of Prefaces. Right. Now, so you had this uh, 100 volumes of which 99 were useful, which one had to plow through. But I realized in the course of my work on Gandhi, while Gandhi was talking me through my research on the environment, on Elwin, on cricket, that, 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 that you really, if you really wanted a, a proper, rounded, biographical perspective, historically, and bi historically sophisticated and biographically rich perspective on Gandhi, you could not rely on his writings alone. You had to look at letters to Gandhi, which are not reproduced in the collected works, except for a few exceptions. You have to look at letters about Gandhi. Uh, I found in archives in India, South Africa, and England, an extraordinarily wide range of government reports on Gandhi. Because the British were obsessed with Gandhi. And the British had fantastic intelligence gathering skills. So they are reflections on Gandhi right from the 1890s to the 1940s, written by lowly district officials right up to the Viceroy and, of course, the Prime Minister. Uh, then you have newspaper accounts, which are in some ways even or at least as rich as the archival materials. And Gandhi was reported about in the local press, the regional press, the national press, and the international press. You know, uh, uh, those of you who have an interest in these things, just go to the New York Times, uh, which is, I think, on a... Uh, uh, the New York Times archive is something called ProQuest, mm -hmm. which every Harvard student gets for free. Uh, and uh, if you just do New York Times, Gandhi, 1921 to 1948, and you'll see thousands of entries coming up. And all these kind of wide range of sources give you a many-sided perspective on Gandhi. So that's the first... In a sense, uh, a respect in which I hope my book, Gandhi Before India, adds, it adds new material. You know, new letters, documents, poems, reflections, secret intelligence reports, uh, and cartoons, and so on and so forth, Gandhi. Uh, but I have mentioned the range of Gandhi's friendships, and I'll end my talk with something about a particular friendship. But that, again, is um, an aspect of biographical writing uh, that some biographers don't understand. That if you truly want to understand, truly want to appreciate and investigate your main subject, you can only do so in the context of your main subjects, friends, associates, followers, rivals, and enemies, and not least family. And this constellation of relationships uh, is often missing in uh, portraits of Gandhi, biographical portraits of Gandhi, which follow the narrative line through the main subject and through those 97 volumes of his writings. So I got very interested in the cast of secondary characters Gandhi had to contend with. 
Now, the secondary characters of his Indian phase are reasonably well known. Uh, at least the Indians in this room and all uh, you know, students, amateur or professional of Indian history, know about Nehru Patel, Gandhi's close political associates, Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay, arguably the most remarkable Indian woman of the 20th century, who had a close and sometimes combative relationship with Gandhi, socialists like Lohia and Jayaprakash, and what they got and what they did not get from Gandhi. Uh, you know about his, uh, uh, apart from his political associates, you know about the social workers who were shaped by him, like the remarkable <coughs> English Admiral's daughter, Madeleine Slade, who becomes Meera Ben, uh, like the ecological economist J.C. Kumarapa, who was also part of Gandhi's ashram, Gandhi's secretary Mahadev Desai, who often edited his works, and including his autobiography, which he translated. So you know about some of these people. You also know about his great Indian adversaries, Jinnah and Ambedkar. And uh, you know, of course, about uh, what Winston Churchill, Louis Mountbatten, and the other <coughs> imperialists he had to contend with thought about Gandhi. But I found in the course of my research that there was a fascinating cast of secondary characters in the earlier phases of Gandhi's life. My book, Gandhi Before India, and the title uh, sort of evokes that, is, starts with his birth in Gujarat, uh, his uh, schooling in Porbandar and in Rajkot. I discovered his mark sheets which were in an obscure book published in the 1960s by a former headmaster of his school. And to my utter delight, he was a second class student. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, there's a certain distinction. In fact, ex an enormous distinction, and dare I say obsession among Indians, with being a first class student. And there's a certain pride uh, that some people take in being a third class student. You know, in my own family, uh, the gentleman sitting there was always a first class student, but his brother, who was a kind of twin to him, was a third class student or failed. And both were equally distinguished in my eyes growing up. You know, Venki had his brother who always failed. But there's really no distinction in being a second class student, which is what I was. And to my great relief, so was Gandhi. <laughs> so it starts with uh, his upbringing, his family, the influence of his mother, uh, who was a kind of a religious ecumenist of sorts. He was a, uh, a member of a kind of heretical uh, Hindu sect. Then he goes to London and he talks about particularly his years in the vegetarian society. Gandhi went to London to qualify as a lawyer and it's there that he uh, uh, really through the vegetarian society which he joined early and where he became a vegetarian not merely by custom and tradition which he was previously but by conviction. It's in the vegetarian society that he learned how to work within an organization, how to uh, make propaganda for a cause. It's in the vegetarian society that he made his first friendships with English Christians across the racial and religious boundary. And it's the journal of the vegetarian society of the London that he wrote uh, of London that he wrote his first articles. So he learned to write and to craft an argument in print, something he was extremely good at in the vegetarian society. Then the book moves back to, to India and uh, to his failure in the bar in Bombay. He failed twice. Incidentally, he failed in uh, 1892 when he comes back uh, from England and again in 1901 when he goes back from South Africa, he tries again and fails twice and had he succeeded on either occasion, we would not be meeting here today uh, because he would have just been an ordinary successful Gujarati lawyer in Bombay. <laughs> now, so he fails the first time, goes to South Africa and then my book tracks him through his years in Natal, which was a coastal province in the east, dominated by British uh, expatriates. And later on, he spent his last decade in South Africa in the Transvaal, in the city of Johannesburg, which in many ways is formative to Gandhi. The Transvaal, unlike Natal, was ruled by Dutch-speaking colonists known as the Afrikaners. And working on this book was enormously educative for me, not least in greatly enlarging from, certainly I started at zero and went a little further ahead, in the history of South Africa. Uh, it's, some, it's not often appreciated that these two decades, 1893 to 1903, were crucial in the history of South Africa. You know, uh, this is the time uh, the colony was being populated by European immigrants uh, who were trying to establish their control over the African majority who were large and dispersed in the countryside. And in between 
the Africans and the Europeans <coughs> who are the Indians, uh, who were smaller in number, but unlike the Africans who were partly based in the cities, there was a large contingent of indent indentured laborers and there was a contingent of merchants in the cities who posed a threat to the Europeans because they, op they opened shops on the main street, street and using family labor and working longer hours, they outcompeted the Europeans. And Gandhi became an activist for the Indians. And it's in Johannesburg that he, uh, where his uh, ideas on Satyagraha or non-violent resistance are shaped. It's in Johannesburg that he first go to, goes to jail. It's in Johannesburg between 1907 and 1910-11 that he leads a mass movement where hundreds of others goes to jail, go to jail, where he uh, acquires uh, a confidence in himself as a leader. It's in Johannesburg that he makes more friends across racial and religious boundaries. Uh, it's in Johannesburg <coughs> uh, that he starts a journal and becomes uh, again, a far more accomplished writer. Uh, so, in many ways, it's the city of Johannesburg that shapes the Gandhi we know. And more broadly, it's the diaspora that makes Gandhi what he was. So this book is really about uh, Gandhi the Gujarati, Gandhi the English gentleman, and above all, Gandhi the expatriate in South Africa. And had he not gone to South Africa, uh, he would never have developed his moral, political, philosophical ideas. And that's really the argument of the book made in uh, great detail through descriptions of uh, his activities, his friendships, his rivalries, his struggles, his movements, his eccentricities, his obsession with food and health, uh, with celibacy. Uh, you know, the, it's also in Johannesburg that Gandhi discovers his great mentor Tolstoy, whom he would not have read had he lived, uh, had he gone every day to the Bombay High Court for sure. I don't know how many. Uh, Bombay High Court lawyers, even the most learned, read Tolstoy. Now, what's interesting about Gandhi and Tolstoy is that Gandhi, so far as I know, never read Anna Karenina, Karenina or War and Peace. He had no interest in Tolstoy, the novelist. He was fascinated and intrigued and obsessed by Tolstoy, the moralist. Tolstoy gave up writing fiction to become a social activist, uh, to work for religious harmony, uh, to preach conscientious objection, pacifism, and to simplify his life. In an essay that Tolstoy wrote, which uh, Gandhi most likely read, because it came out in 1906, which is the year Gandhi takes his vow of celibacy, Tolstoy said, uh, and I sort of paraphrase, he said, a person trying to reform society uh, has to get rid of idleness, gluttony and carnal desire. Idleness, gluttony and carnal desire, three cardinal sins, uh, especially of the Russian aristocrat. And Gandhi had no problem with idleness, he worked hard, not with gluttony because he was a vegetarian, but he became obsessed with celibacy. The control of sexual desire he saw as fundamental to detaching himself from worldly pleasures and dedicating himself to a life of social service. And one consequence of this was that he separated himself from his family. He sent the family, he had four children, to, an, uh, to a rural settlement in Natal while he continued his activist work in, South, in Johannesburg. And my book has a great deal about uh, various aspects of, um, how should I put it? it? It's about Gandhi's heroism, his struggles, his sacrifices. It's about his eccentricities. It's also about his deficiencies. His, uh, Partial blindness towards the Africans. He starts with a kind of conventional hierarchy of races where the Europeans are at the top, the Indians are adjacent, and the Africans are right at the bottom. Over a period of time, uh, he sheds some of those prejudices. He acquires a more nuanced appreciation of uh, uh, the oppression of the Africans. He advocates non-violent resistance for them too. He makes African acquaintances, but not really African friends. So that's one, you can say, partial blind spot, but which is typical of a, uh, you know, uh, a Hindu man in the 19th century, to be somewhat or slightly or largely racist. The other great failure, of course, which I talk about a great deal in my book, is uh, his relationship with his eldest son, who is a man of intelligence, passion, and ambition, who wants to educate himself, uh, who wants to become a lawyer, 
but who is forced by Gandhi to, you know, Gandhi tries to mold him in his own, you know, tries to suppress his intellectual ambitions, uh, make sure that he does not, uh, you know, his romantic passion towards his wife, whom he loved dearly, the son, is kind of Gandhi detests because it goes against uh, the credo of celibacy and he, uh, eventually the son runs away from South Africa to India so this, and becomes really a, a devastated and broken man. So it's a large canvas, uh, you know, historically, biographically and if I have two minutes I'll just read uh, okay. uh, two or three paragraphs from the book which is about his friendships which uh, Pratap also mentioned. Gandhi's closest friends in South Africa included a remarkable English couple. Uh, they were called the Pollacks. Henry was Jewish. Millie was Christian. They got married in December 1905 with Gandhi serving as the witness. And the next month they moved into the Gandhi household. So there was Gandhi, his wife Kasturba, four little children and the Pollacks. Now, before I read out uh, uh, a few paragraphs about what this meant, I'd like you to appreciate how revolutionary this was. Could they have been in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1905 an interracial household? Could they have been in London or in Bombay, you know, so-called cosmopolitan international cities? We are talking about Johannesburg, the most racist city in the most racist country in the world, and you have this interracial household. Uh, and it's, this is a household that is <coughs> so strange uh, to European eyes and to Indian eyes that the strangeness I'm going to reveal to you and this is where I'll end uh, with an excerpt from Ga the diary of Gandhi's nephew. Gandhi has a nephew called Chaganlal who works on the rural settlement in Natal where Gandhi's journal Indian Opinion is produced and Chaganlal, uh, 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 and Chaganlal is in charge of the journal and the settlement and he travels to Johannesburg from Natal to meet his uncle. And this is how he saw the next few days. Uh, by the way, as I read the excerpts, I will use the word bhai or brother, which is what Chagarnal calls Gandhi in his diary. He says, January 4th, 1906, arrived at Johannesburg station. Bhai and Mrs. Pollack were there to receive me. <laughs> Reached home at seven o'clock with them. After a wash, went to the table for dinner found the westernized style very odd. I began to wonder but could not decide whether our ways were better or theirs. January 5th, 1906. I walked with Bhai to his office two miles away. Talked about Indian opinion on the way. We reached at 9.30. Seeing a girl working in the office made me wonder. The girl, by the way, it was a remarkable white Jewish woman called Sonia Schlesin, who among other things, she's a major figure in my book, among other things, made Gandhi somewhat less patriarchal. So this is what he says. Uh, seeing a girl working in the office made me wonder. The accounts of the press were gone through. Returned home with Bhai at 5.30 p.m. I began to wonder again when I found the English friends, the Pollacks, mixing freely with everyone. Now here you're talking about Banyas, who are really very fastidious, you know, middle class merchants, which is Gandhi's community in Khaganath, fastidious about whom to eat, whom to mix with, what to eat and so on. Now, so he goes on. January 6th, 1906. A few people were invited to dinner at Bhai's house in connection with Mr. Pollack's marriage. Among the guests were English people, Muslims and Hindus. I felt they had crossed the limits in their jokes at dinner. <laughs> and here is my gloss on this diary entry. Chagan was puzzled and confused by what he saw. The white lady secretary in the uncle's office. The jokes and the banter and the displays of physical affection between Henry and Millie in his uncle's home. The eating at the same table of Indians and Europeans, Hindus and Muslims. To his conventional Hindu eyes, the household was eccentric. To the conventional white Christian in Johannesburg, the household must have been positively heretical. Now, I'll just end with one remark, uh, which was told to me on my several visits to South Africa by three or four different South Africans in different cities. When they heard that I was writing a book on Gandhi in South Africa, 
the first part of what will be a two-part biography. Uh, they, of course, were courteous and helpful. They, they directed me to the sources in the South African archives that would help me. And then they said, you gave us a lawyer, we gave you back a Mahatma. <laughs> At that wonderful insight, I've tried to, in the way of the historian, try to uh, uh, explain and outline and document in my book. Thank you. Um, so we have about uh, 20, 25 minutes. We'll just open it up immediately to questions. Um, so if you could just make your questions or comments very brief, because I'm sure there'll be a lot of people wanting uh, to say something, and we'll try and give as many uh, as possible uh, an opportunity. Ram, can you just yeah. repeat the question the, so that it gets recorded? The question just, was just... Uh, about the contradictions in Gandhi's thought. If you read him, you see, hmm. you know, at one level he's very modern, but at one level he's very traditional. Need I try to reconcile them? Well, uh, I explain them, I lay them out. You're right, he's, he, he, you know, he's contradictory. And one of the reasons is he's an intellectual uh, and an original thinker who's not widely read. You know, uh, for example, if there's no, it's not known that he read Karl Marx or Adam Smith. He arrives at his, he had, and he read some English dissidents, apart from Tolstoy, mm. read Ruskin. Uh, but he made his own way. Uh, through the world and through his experiences, his reflections uh, and his friendships, he arrived at his philosophy, which is eccentric, bizarre, but also dazzlingly original. And um, uh, among the ori original aspects of his philosophy are, of course, nonviolence, which is nonviolent collective struggle. You know, Tolstoy was advocating mm. conscientious objections. So if you're called up in a conscript army, you don't go. Uh, at the same time as Gandhi, you have Indian revolutionaries who are advocating armed struggle against the British. You also have Indian liberals who are politely asking the British for more rights. That is how Gandhi starts, in fact. You know? And then he kind of discovers or innovates or, or uh, fashions this uh, theory of collective non-violent civil disobedience, which is applied, of course, in this country and in Burma and in Eastern Europe and in many other places. Now. Uh, Likewise with religious pluralism. I mean, Gandhi's ideas are completely original and in a sense eccentric. You know, he doesn't believe, he's not an atheist, nor is he a religious fundamentalist. He believes, partly inspired by Tolstoy and by a Jain teacher he had, that every religion is a mixture of truth and error. So, and you know, the way to make your religion more truthful is to see it in the mirror of somebody else's religion, li and likewise. So, and, and his environmental ideas, so they all kind of, and, uh, there are aspects of his thought I found bizarre. You know, for example, there's a chapter in this book on, on Gandhi's first book, Hind Swaraj, which unfortunately and regrettably has been taken uh, to be the essential distillation of Gandhi's ideas. Uh, that's because uh, Gandhi wrote 90 volumes and this is the only integrated book he ever wrote. You know, he wrote two volumes of autobiography, but uh, the Western educational canon is based on texts. So you have Marx's Capital, and you have Weber's Protestant Ethic, and you have Simone de Beauvoir's Second Sex, and you have Foucault's The Order of Things, and you have Gandhi's Hind Swaraj. That's sad, because I don't know the other works. You know, maybe Capital gives you Marx, but Hind Swaraj does not give you Gandhi. You have to add, there's some bizarre aspects about, you know, Hind Swaraj, this is interesting. We're talking about uh, Gandhi as a diasporic figure. Hind Swaraj is extraordinarily nostalgic uh, about, you know, uh, starry eyed about Indian culture and Indian civilization and its superiority over your, you know, it's the kind of thing a, diaspor a diasporic ch chap would, you know, like to think. And often still thinks, by the way. <laughs> and when Gandhi wrote Hind Swaraj, he had never met a single ordinary Indian. He had never met a peasant or a money lender or a worker. He knew Gujarat, his middle class family, and he knew South Africa and London. And from there he is writing about the greatness of Indian civilization. <laughs> and hence you must read, if you, you must Sort of, there's some great things in Hind Swaraj. It's got a fantastic philosophical de defense of nonviolence, which I, I would still urge you to read, that chapter at least. Uh, so I think one way of resolving these contradictions is partly to say he's, he's original. The other way is to see the evolution over time. You know, uh, that later on, for example, his views on caste or on gender, uh, really mature, you know, and he said, or on Africans, as I explained. Uh, you know, you, you have to see it as a historian would chronologically to see the development. He's, he is evolving, he's evolving slowly. You know, my book originally had an epilogue, which I left out. It's called Gandhi's African Afterlives. And that was meant to answer 21st century 
progressive critics of Gandhi. And I said, forget it. That's not my job as a historian. I'll keep it later on. All right. No, but I'll summarize it for you. His views continue to evolve. In the 1920s, when he writes Satyagraha in South Africa, he's much more appreciative of African culture in parts. In the 30s, he begins to advocate a joint front of Indians, Europeans, and Africans. In the 40s and 50s, it's Gandhi's ideas that shape the anti-apartheid struggle. All the major leaders of the African National Congress from 1912 to the 1950s are inspired by Gandhi. And Gandhi himself is writing in the 30s and 40s that you can only have a consolidated front. And Yusuf Dadu and Monty Naikar, who are two great South Africans, travel to India, meet Gandhi, and then go and uh, forge a famous doctor's pact, which is a pact with the African National Congress, which, of course, uh, inspires the 46 pa passive resistance movement, 52 uh, defiance campaign, and so on and so forth. So Africans, uh, you know, African uh, uh, national, if you travel in uh, South Africa, you know, they will who have seen all of this will tell you that Gandhi was our leader too, of the second rank, after Mandela and Dambo and so on. But his views evolved. And if you, if you read about the 30s and 40s, it's quite different from the 1880s. Mm. And it's important, I think, not to adopt anachronistic attitudes to Gandhi or anyone else. You know, one of my great maxims uh, comes from the Cambridge historian F.W. Maitland, who says, that which is now in the past was once in the future. I mean, that's something which I think every historian should have above his desk. You know, that which is now in the past was once in the future. And the question was, how does he shame the ruler? And was that really, in many ways, his most uh, powerful, uh, you know, political tactic? You know, there are various layers to that question, you know, on non-violence. Uh, I think, uh, and shaming the ruler also means recognizing the essential humanity of the ruler. You know, uh, one of, one, because of the friendships with English people that Gandhi made uh, in England and in South Africa. Because at crucial points, for example, when he was nearly lynched by a white mob in Durban in 1897, it was an English couple that saved him. Gandhi recognizes the essential humanity even in the person who's oppressing you. So, you know, in that sense, you know, you call through non-violence, through sacrifice, through going to jail, rather than shooting them out of the room, you uh, recall them to their better or more humane senses. So I think that's part of what he learns. And as you say, he learns it through experience, through friendship. It's not a great revelation that he has himself. Uh, but there's a question about nonviolence that I just put on the table. In many situations, nonviolence works. You know, it worked in this country. Uh, it worked in, 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 in India. Uh, will it work in China? Would it have worked against Hitler? Even in South Africa, uh, the African National Congress, after 50 years of practicing nonviolence, abandoned it for armed struggle. Mm. So there's a question. I think in many situations it works. Uh, there's a remark, apocryphal remark, perhaps apocryphal, but perhaps true remark, attributed to Ho Chi Minh, uh, which goes like this. If Mahatma Gandhi had been fighting the French, he would have given up nonviolence within a week. <laughs> Now, having said that, I think in most, I mean, there are studies that show, I think there are some fine studies by political scientists that show that compared to movements, movements of liberation based on armed struggle, movements of liberation based on non-violence collective resistance are likely to produce sustainable democracies in the long run, whereas a violent struggle produces a totalitarian regime which practices retribution and revenge against its imaginary enemies and so on. But there could be limits to non-violence. One of the things I have to deal with in uh, volume two or the next book uh, is the question of Gandhi advocated non-violence against Hitler. And there was a famous rebuttal mm. by Martin Buber, mm. the great Jewish theologian. So there are questions. But by and large, yes. And I think by and large, the, the, the great thing about and that's why I think mm. Gandhi is to be distinguished uh, from Marxists. Maybe not Marx. Marxists will tell you, and I say this as someone who intellectually grew up in Calcutta, you know, in many ways the home of <laughs> Marxism, will tell you, you have to hate the capitalist. You have to hate him. <laughs> okay. And likewise, of course, on, on race, you would have people in this country arguing, you have to hate the white man. Right? Now, I think these are things that Gandhi uh, eschewed, and I think that's part of his nobility. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, well, that's a wonderful question. The question that uh, Professor McFarker raised is that my account... <coughs> Uh, in my talk and partly in my book, suggests that uh, it's nurture over nature. 
and it's really circumstances and historical mm. experiences that made Gandhi and not his inner character. No, I think it's largely nurture but also partly nature. I think two aspects of Gandhi's character that stand out are uh, or several aspects. One, as I've already said, uh, skepticism towards received texts which included not only intellectual texts but also possibly religious texts. I think a curiosity about other faiths. You know, that's the interesting thing about Gandhi. You know, he's reading Islamic texts or Russian texts very early on. He's making Muslim friends, Parsi friends. He's going to churches in London. I mean, which Indian in 1888, uh, 89 would walk into a congregational chapel? Right. That's all. That's fascinating. Then Charles Bradlaugh dies and Charles Bradlaugh is an atheist and he goes to his funeral. So you know, he's even interested in the atheist community. So the curiosity is a Hindu, but partly heterodox, but this also... Uh, uh, may have been influenced in part by his mother. But still, that's one thing. He's curious certainly about other faiths but at right till the end of his life. I mean, this is something very important. The other is, a, and this can only be nature, I suppose, or, or mostly nature, uh, is a kind of uh, capacity to take physical suffering. You know, like to be nearly assassinated twice uh, and yet come out of it right, and carry on your work. Uh, to uh, go to jail under very hard conditions and never complain about it. To voluntarily deny you the beauties and glories of Indian vegetarian food by saying no salt, spices and pickle. All right. Uh, to deny yourself the beauties and glories of sex. Now, this tells, this is, this is, gives you a, so this is an inner strength. Of, inner, so there are those aspects too. And I wouldn't want to leave you with, uh, 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 with the thought that if, you or I had gone to London and South Africa in the same context, we would have become Gandhi. No, 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 no. I'm not that. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, the question was in the course of uh, researching this book, what are the new things I learned about Gandhi? You know, as I said, uh, I, I've been you know, say interested and obsessed with Gandhi all, his li all my life, you know, and that's true of uh, many Indians like me. Uh, because especially Indians in the humanities, the social sciences. Uh, I come from a family uh, in which several members have been directly or indirectly associated with Gandhi. You know, so happens that my one of my grand uncle was the chief editor of the Collected Works of Mahatma Gandhi, for example. So, and I often argued with him about Gandhi. He was trying to rid me of the idea that you could be an atheist and yet believe in Gandhi. Right now, that's an interesting thought. So I grew up with all of this. And I've met remarkable Gandhians, I've studied him, I was a professor, I was a I'm a historian of the 20th century. So what really surprised me uh, was how much South Africa shaped Gandhi. How much the Polacks and people I've not mentioned. You know, there are various characters in this book who are in many ways more important than Patel and Nehru and Ambedkar and all in shaping Gandhi because they come into his life when he's still being formed. He's not an established figure, you know. Uh, the Polacks make him more open to other ideas. Sonia Schlesin, his Jewish secretary, makes him less patriarchal. Uh, there's a remarkable Tamil called Tambi Naidu, who takes him out of his comfort zone only with working with Gujaratis into understanding the Tamil working class and their problems. Right. Now, so, in many, in South Africa, uh, you know, he was in a situation where non-violence could have worked. Uh, in South Africa, rid him of his belief in the nobility of the British Empire. For example, you know, in London in the 1880s, he there was no racism he faced. Just after he leaves London, an Indian is elected a member of parliament in England. You know, right? So, in many ways, uh, the real discovery of this book was that it's his years in London and especially South Africa uh, that shaped Gandhi and make Gandhi. And hence, uh, to follow uh, other biographies in hastily skipping over this period, in seeing it in a teleological sense, just anticipating what happens, the big things are later, you know. And now you can see the fascinating, now when I write the, second, the sequel, I can see, I can draw some of these connections in a very explicit and direct way. Uh, including characters will come in and out. The Polacks are very interesting. The Polacks break with Gandhi, but they're Gandhi's closest friends. And they're his most intimate friends. And they break with Gandhi about the question of Hitler. You know, at, because Gandhi is advocating non-violence to Hitler and going to jail, the Quit India movement, and here are these Jews, you know, with family members dying. So the, the, that period, so uh, not no particular thing per se, except uh, the physical courage part. You know that a person who I mean, imagine five thousand people coming to kill you, and you know you see through it, and then some Indians try to kill you, and you can't see through it. I mean, except for that, I mean that the kind of personal courage. 
uh, of the man uh, impressed me, but it was more the context, the relationship, than how in many ways he was shaped by South Africa. That's a broader lesson, not a uh, specific one. Okay, I think we so the question was about, I mean, yeah. it was more a comment about the importance of the diaspora and diasporic Indians in shaping African politics and beyond. And I completely agree with you. I'll just make one last point, a, a, a reaction to it, which is in a sense connected by my book, and it uh, leads, uh, links to the earlier question, what are the things that surprised me? One of the things that surprised me, and was a complete revelation, was how closely Gandhi's movement and the diaspora, the suffering of people in the diaspora was followed in India. You know, I went to a great colonial source, which is the report on native newspapers in India. Mm. And in 1908, 1909, 1910, the Tamil, Kannada, Marathi newspapers in Rajamandri, Vishakhapatnam, Cochin, Bangalore were writing minutely about Gandhi and his movement. Mm. I found in the archives a play written in Telugu and translated by the British about, you know, the diaspora and the sufferings and Gandhi as a kind of redeeming figure, you know, in a Hindu mythological sense. So, in a, in a, in, at a time before uh, the internet and facts and so on, you know, this was really a global movement. I mean, it was South Africa, India, and England. And that was uh, quite, it was revelatory to me. Okay, um, we could go on for another few days. Uh, Ram is such an engaging, uh, engaging speaker. Um, Ram will be here to sign, sign books, and, and, and maybe there'll be an opportunity to continue the conversation.